Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Owen Lewis, and I'm delighted that today we are joined by uh, Virginius Sinkovecius, uh, who is the European Commissioner for Environment, Oceans and Fisheries. I'd like to particularly thank him for sparing the time to be with us today. Virginius Sinkovecius has been European Commissioner for the Environment, Oceans and Fisheries since uh, 2019. Previously, he served as Minister of Economy in the government of Lithuania from uh, 2017 to 2019, and before that was chair of the Economic Committee in the Lithuanian Parliament. Before his election to Parliament in 2016, the Commissioner was a team lead for regulatory affairs at Invest Lithuania and the project coordinator for Lithuanian airports. Uh, the Commissioner holds uh, degrees in international relations, a BA in international relations and affairs from Aberystwyth and an MA in European international affairs from Maastricht University. Uh, his title today is the EU's strategy for environmental recovery. Um, he will speak to us for about uh, 20 minutes and after his presentation, we will go to a question and answer session with you our audience. You'll be able to join uh, this uh, uh, discussion uh, with uh, the Q&A function, uh, which you see there on the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, I'd encourage you to uh, feel free to send your questions in throughout the session rather than waiting to the, to the end. And I'd also uh, like to ask you please to identify yourself and any affiliation when you ask a question. A, a reminder that uh, today's presentation and the Q&A session will be on the record. Um, uh, you're also encouraged to uh, join the discussion on Twitter using the handle uh, EPA, IIEA. But um, firstly, let me please hand over to Laura Burke, uh, Director General of the Environmental Protection Agency, for some opening remarks, please. Laura. Thank you very much, Owen, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm absolutely delighted that the Commissioner uh, could take time out today to, to join us and to give us his insights with regard to how the EU uh, intends setting Europe on a course for environmental recovery. And maybe just for a couple of minutes to talk about the Irish situation and, and how that, I suppose, ultimately will link in with the European priorities. Of course, Ireland has a, its part to play in achieving an environmental recovery and a transition to a climate resilient, biodiversity rich and carbon, a climate neutral economy. The overall assessment from the EPA's most recent State of the Environment report, which was published in November last year, it highlights that the overall quality of Ireland's environment is not what it should be, and the outlook is not optimistic unless we accelerate uh, the implementation of solutions across all sectors and society. Our assessment reveals that enduring and systemic challenges are putting pressure on the environment and remain to be solved. And these cut across environmental topics such as climate, water, air, biodiversity and waste, and across all sectors of the society and economy and organizations. So whether it be business, policy, uh, individuals in their own homes, all of these have a role to play with regard to our environmental standards and environmental recovery. Ireland is already losing out on much of what is important in our environment. Unspoiled areas are being squeezed out and we're losing our pristine waters and the habitats that, provi that provide vital spaces for biodiversity. Now more than ever, Ireland's green and blue spaces, which include things like urban parks, coasts, lakes, rivers, forests and bogs are essential components of our health infrastructure. And we've seen this really over the last year and a half uh, when we've all been keeping more local into uh, and recognizing the importance therefore of our local environment. So really, when we talk about the environment, we're talking about our own health and well-being. And a key message from the State of the Environment Report is that the absence of an overarching national environmental policy position is negatively impacting on success across multiple environmentally related plans and policies. 
And effectively, the sum of the parts don't make up a coherent whole. There, there's no, for example, eighth environmental action program in an Irish context. Environmental issues such as climate change, air, water, uh, biodiversity, they can't be looked at in isolation as they're complex, interconnected, and need to be tackled in an integrated way. We have many individual plans and programs, but they don't, I suppose, all come together as one overall policy position for the country. And so that's what we're saying we need now. Um, and we need to be clear on our ambition to protect Ireland's environment in the short and medium and long term. And on our commitment to live up to this clean green image of Ireland. A policy position would provide a national vision that all government departments, agencies, businesses, communities and individuals can sign up to. And so we can all play our part in protecting the environment. Our report also, of course, calls for better implementation and delivery of existing legislation and policies. And I know this is something that is close to the heart of our colleagues in the European Commission as well. Many plans and programmes are already in place, which, if fully implemented, will go a long way to resolving persistent environmental issues. Full implementation of and compliance with legislation is a must to protect our environment. Finally, it is important to reflect that as Ireland emerges from the COVID-19 pandemic and we look to stimulate economic recovery, we need to do so uh, in a green way and apply a green investment approach. So I look forward to hearing the Commissioner's thoughts on Europe's approach to this uh, and how it will, I suppose, support member states such as Ireland in delivering this uh, green recovery that we are looking forward to. Because we must all remember that a clean environment provides opportunity to deliver health, social and economic dividends that ultimately will support resilience and recovery. So thank you very much. And I really look forward now to hearing the Commissioner's talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your introduction and, and, and thank you for your remarks. Uh, of course, good afternoon to, to, to everyone, Ms. Burke and, and Professor Lewis. Uh, my also sincere thanks to, to the Institute of International and European Affairs and the Irish Environment Protection Agency for uh, this kind invitation today. And today we are talking virtually, but I'm of course very happy to say that I'll be visiting the Republic in a few weeks. And you've asked me to address a very broad question, uh, the EU's strategy for environmental recovery. And I'll do what I can to cover some main areas, and I'll be happy, of course, to address further areas in the questions at the end. I have to say I like very much this formulation when you talk about environmental recovery, you do two things. You accept that there is a real crisis, not one problem, but the whole complex of problems that need to be addressed. And you agree that there is hope that we can recover. We are not pessimists. And in its uh, uh, late in the day for many of, of these problems, but they do have solutions and, and many of which actually are ready and, 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 and waiting to be implemented. And as the commissioner for environment, it's my job to make those solutions to be better known, to be well implemented in member states, and to keep, uh, you know, making that case for the implementation, not only member state level, but, but also cities, um, regional governments, and so on. Because it's a very strong case, and I think what's most importantly, it's wins over more and more people all the time. And it sends very uh, powerful message. So what is this complex of, of problems? Problems like climate change, biodiversity loss and, and pollution, which are not unique to Europe. They are driven by the same forces all over the world and, and by the unsustainable exploitation of natural resources, production and consumption patterns, uh, the rapid pace of urbanization, when we factor in the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, we begin to see both the fragility of our current economic model and the extent to which our impact on nature is undermining human well-being and, in, and 
compromising our efforts at sustainable development. We need integrated solutions, a systemic approach that tackles these global environmental and climate crises together as a part of a green transition that protects and nurtures the, the planet we depend on. And this is the optimism I mentioned at the beginning, the European Green Deal. It commits the EU to promoting and implementing ambitious policies for environment and climate, but not just in Europe or in Ireland, but around the globe. And it's a plan for recovery, for a green recovery, a plan for joint international efforts, global solidarity, multilateralism at its core, and, and preventing any lapse into a short-term recovery based on fossil fuels, or and the intensive use of resources. And Europe needs to, to, to set a credible example, showing that a green transition is possible and, and most importantly, feasible. So that's the big picture, which we have to keep in mind. In practice, the Green Deal means very specific initiatives in, in policy areas that are connected like climate and biodiversity, but also agriculture, energy transport, waste management, and, 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 and so on. And it means a new emphasis on environmental governance, compliance, assurance, and citizen engagement. And I would like to, to, to spend the uh, rest of my time uh, going over these issues maybe a bit more carefully. And let's start with one particular policy area, especially important, I think, for Ireland. And I'm thinking of biodiversity. And, and, and there is no doubt that nature is in a dramatic state of decline. Science clear, science tell us uh, that wildlife populations fell by 60% in the last four decades due to human activities. The decline is evident on land and in the seas. Importantly for, for Ireland, it is especially severe in agriculture areas and, and affects almost all species and the habitats related to agriculture, from insects to, to farmland birds and plants. The need to act, of course, is urgent, not just for the sake of biodiversity itself, but because we depend on nature and ecosystem services it provides. And if you want healthy and productive agriculture, you need healthy ecosystems. And healthy agro ecosystems also help us store carbon, which is vital when your goal is carbon neutrality. So if we fail to tackle the crisis, farmers will be among the first to suffer as soils degrade and, and pollinators disappear. But if we restore these ecosystems, farmers and society as a whole will reap the benefits for generations to come. So the European Green Deal stresses the need to act on climate, but it stresses the need for action on biodiversity as well. Europe has a biodiversity strategy for 2030, as you know, and as a part of, of, of that strategy, we are developing a nature restoration law. The long-term goal is to ensure that our ecosystems are restored by 2030, and we need to start acting now. That will involve new legislation with legally binding targets to restore ecosystems, to ensure that biodiversity is on a path of uh, recovery. Of course, that will uh, in, in involve a, 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 a new legislation uh, with legally binding targets. Uh, more than anything, we need to build up nature's resilience. But we also need to do that, ensuring that other agendas, other policy areas, integrate a concern for biodiversity to safeguard, to safeguard it instead of causing harm. And that's why we speak, for instance, of nature-based solutions that are not only good for the climate, but for biodiversity as well. My hope is that public policy in Ireland evolves in a similar way. For example, climate action and timber production have been described as the policy uh, drivers for Irish forestry. What about adding biodiversity as a policy driver, not simply as a, 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 a matter of complying with requirements, but of delivering positive results? Uh, the Green Deal is all about people, and I think that uh, that comes through very strongly in policies like, like Farm to Fork. This is the EU strategy for a sustainable food system. The goal is ensuring the long-term safety, sustainability, and security of our food system through a transformation 
of the way we produce, process, transport, market, and consume food products. What we need is a system which has a neutral or even positive environmental input. And when you consider the complexity of our food system and the number of policy areas involved, you soon realize that there is no simple solution. And it will take coherent action and involvement from many different stakeholders, including public authorities at all levels of administration. But it's a fight that we need to have. And the result will be a system more resilient to shocks like pandemics and better suited to ensuring food security in future emergencies. A strategy that provides guidance and support for food producers as they transition to greater sustainability. And the, the, the aim is to help farmers and, and, and fishers strengthen their position in the supply chain. And the new common agricultural policy includes the tools to support this transition. The tools are there, but they have to be used and it's, it's up to the member states to use these possibilities in their national plans, in particular with regard to eco schemes. And the funds are there as well. Europe's multi-annual financial framework includes a specific allocation for implementation of the biodiversity strategy and farm to fork through the pillar two of the cap. The, <clears throat> the commission uh, made recommendations to each member state on the specific objective of the cap uh, before submission of their uh, draft strategic plans. And those recommendations include paying particular attention to addressing uh, the targets that stem from the biodiversity and from farm to fork. And then member states are asked to, to, to set explicit national values for those targets, taking into account their specific situation. And on basis of those values, measures should be identified in those strategic plans. And we will be carefully uh, assessing those plans to make sure they can deliver on this greener ambition for the benefit of all farmers, foresters, and, 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 and people, rest of the society. Another aspect of, of, of biodiversity uh, and farming that deserves in my opinion, far more attention is the state of our soils. As with the climate and biodiversity crisis, the traffic lights for soil health are turning uh, on the red. And the, the impact of, of land and soil degradation is very large and, and it comes with a huge cost estimated at 38 billion euros per year for the European Union and the public wants action and we need to deliver. The benefits of soil restoration are 10 times higher than the costs. So investing in preventing land degradation and soil restoration makes sound economic sense. And we are working to address the problem and you can expect a new strategy in the coming months. The last biodiversity file I want to mention is the new EU forest strategy adopted in the middle of July. It includes a number of, of, of targets and commitments on actions to be taken for improving forest biodiversity and resilience. There is a lot of good news in there for foresters, like the possibility of developing more nature-friendly activities, such as controlled ecotourism in protected areas that could be the basis for a long-term sustainable development for local communities, as compared to the intensification of forest harvesting, which leaves these areas devoid uh, of resources and subject to more intense floods and, and other disasters. And the work on guidelines for afforestation and, and, and reforestation might be of particular interest to Ireland and its uh, national afforestation scheme. We are working on them with, uh, with, uh, with member states and stakeholders. We are aware of the negative impacts that some afforestation projects can have on endangered species like hen harrier and, and freshwater pearl mussel, or drain peatlands that are now suffering from erosion. So these are delicate matters and they need careful handling and you have to plant the right trees in the right place at the right time to maximize the environmental benefits of afforestation and reforestation. I want to move now on um, 
to the second main focus today, and, and, and that is environmental governance. And you are probably wondering how the governance question relates to the European Green Deal and, and, and to issues like the ambition of being biodiversity resilient and, and carbon neutral. But it's actually very important because it helps us close what we call the implementation gap. The clear light there is between what we aim to achieve and what we actually achieve with our environmental laws and initiatives. This isn't a, a problem for uh, bureaucrats. We are talking about real world effects which affect people's lives. And here in, 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 in Ireland as elsewhere, we have clear evidence of, of, of the effects of, of failing to reach the targets for water quality, air quality and, and, and biodiversity. And the EU nature directives, for example, aim to ensure that natural habitats and, and protected species have favorable conservation status. In Ireland, when we look at blank bogs and raised bogs, old oak woodlands and, 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 and semi-natural grasslands, we find that many have poor status and are continuing to deteriorate. The situation of many Irish farmland birds is also bad and some are even at risk of disappearing. Others, uh, rare species such as uh, the freshwater pelmusel, which depends on very clean rivers, are at a high risk. And many of the answers have to be linked to governance. Firstly, uh, to the role of public authorities in delivering uh, compliance on the ground through what we call environmental compliance assurance. Uh, the secondly, uh, the, 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 the secondly through citizen, of course, engagement, uh, the role of environmental NGOs, of course, uh, very important. And if you want to, to safeguard uh, biodiversity, you have to implement the laws, uh, but that can only work if, if land managers comply with, with applicable uh, rules and safeguards, and if those rules and safeguards are themselves fit for purpose and it's up to public authorities to promote that compliance and enforce the rules. I have to say that in Ireland, the picture is mixed. There are some very positive examples, uh, like uh, the results-based uh, farming model developed in, in the Burn with uh, the help of EU funds. Under this model, farmers and scientists agree the results that nature needs and, and payments are made according to the results uh, the scientists verify when it comes to, to compliance. Um, we might say that the model is designed for success and, and this model is spreading, but on the downside, the coverage is still uh, limited and biodiversity is still in retreat. When it comes to monitoring and enforcement, the, the picture in Ireland is very similar to the overall picture around the EU. Those who infringe uh, wildlife rules and commit wildlife crimes seldom face consequences. And this is true of environmental crimes in the general. We are aware of this uh, issue at the commission and we are doing what we can to address it. We bring together environmental agencies, inspectors, uh, police forces, prosecutors, uh, judges in an environmental compliance and governance forum. Ireland's Environmental Protection Agency under Laura Burke uh, has been an active participant providing uh, some great uh, useful and uh, ideas and, and insights. And we're also working on a proposal to strengthen the environmental crime directive. And I hope that collectively we can succeed in, in, in strengthening uh, this compliance assurance. Of course, we can't expect the Environmental Protection Agency to do all the work. Sometimes it is governments themselves or public authorities who fail to comply with legal obligations. Citizens, uh, citizen engagement can counteract these failures, highlighting and, and challenging them, including through national courts. And I sometimes hear that the complaint that public participation and environmental challenges are a break on decision-making and people try to justify restricting public uh, participation and access to justice on this basis. But in practice, it's rarely the case. Public participation and access very often act as important legal safeguards, especially for biodiversity. 
and across the EU, many of the decisions of, of the Court of, of Justice on the EU nature directives are, are the result of questions being put by national courts following legal actions by NGOs. As for access to ju justice, the Court of Justice has stressed the importance of NGOs being able to act in, in the public interest. In July, the Council and Parliament agreed to increase the rights of NGOs to challenge the decisions of, of, of the EU institutions, including the Commission under the Arhus regulation. It would, in, it would incoherent to open doors to NGO oversight at the EU level while closing them at the national level. And access to justice supports the rule of law, and this is true across all time zones in the EU. And that's why commissions uh, commission attaches a special importance to upholding access to justice. Ladies and gentlemen, I have covered quite a lot ground there, and you have been uh, very patient for for last fifteen or twenty minutes. So now I'm going to give uh, you the floor. I'm sure you have uh, some questions. Uh, not just on biodiversity and the environmental governance, but perhaps on many other aspects of, of the Green Deal, as well as on the Irish Recovery and Resilience Plan. Uh, but thank you once again for this opportunity, uh, and I look forward for our short discussion. Thank you indeed, Commissioner. Um, uh, as you say, you have covered a very uh, broad uh, field in your remarks, and that that provokes me to, in some ways, abuse my position as chairman to ask your first question, please. Because when you are dealing with such an extensive area, which impinges on, I suspect, most of your colleagues in the College of Commissioners, um, how, how do you go? I mean, uh, my own uh, limited experience of working in the university, for instance, to reduce the silos which we we perceived uh, between the disciplines. How do you go about um, influencing uh, behavior and policy in in areas which are not maybe your direct responsibility, but transport, energy, um, uh, you know, industry, whatever? Yeah. Uh, yes. So thank you very much. A, a, a very good question. Uh, the good thing about working in, 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 in a commission that all our decisions are collegial. So there is most of the time uh, is, 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 is agreement among, among uh, all other commissioners. And of course, uh, everything what we put out is, is, is uh, well, well discussed. And I, from the very beginning, I said that in our initiatives, uh, we don't need to uh, convince of, of need to act ministers of environment. Usually they are the ones who are supporting us. We need to talk with ministers of finance, ministers of energy, uh, ministers of transport in member states who actually take decisions in areas which, 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 which affect uh, our goals. What's good about the work in the commission that we have the clear plan. It's the European Green Deal. And we clearly recognize that the Green Deal is not only a sort of environmental or climate policy, it's actually across all policy areas, a uh, horizontal matter, which each commissioner has to, 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 to do their part. And for example, if you look at the Green Deal cluster, we have their commissioner responsible for energy, Commissioner responsible for agriculture, and even commissioner responsible for transport. So we work in one cluster, and of course, we, we, we harmonize our policies among ourselves. I think this uh, two years were, 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 were sort of very much breaking points, where we showed not only that we are able to put a, up front a, an ambitious uh, agenda, but we filled it with the policy. Climate law is an excellent example, but latest uh, package Fit for 55, which actually not only announces about increased uh, decarbonization goal uh, to 2030, uh, but also 
sets a clear rules how we're going to get there with 11 uh, policy areas uh, involved. It's a very complex package. And of course, member states, uh, they have their opinion about one or the other part. But what I'm happy about that nobody is even questioning a package. That package has to be accepted and that this is our pathway to 2050 and it's legislative. So it's not only a, a, a sort of a, a promise, but it's legal. Uh, so of course it changes a lot. I think all this um, gives you a good glimpse what is the opportunity window out there. And that of course makes my job way easier to speak with my colleagues, convince, uh, convince them of the need uh, for a change, of uh, the need of a green uh, agenda, because I think they themselves also realize very well that transport or, or energy sector or agriculture sector, if they want to be competitive in a near future, in a very near future, they have to uh, look for those green opportunities and be the first one on top of it. Uh, I think everyone in Europe remembers very well when small car maker in US announced that they will be making, uh, you know, greenest, most innovative, uh, equipped with uh, top-notch digital tools cars, and big European manufacturers laughed at it and said that we're not going to turn electric uh, anytime soon. In just a three, four year times, we have a completely different shift. Uh, there is a recognition that the opportunity was missed and now there is a, even a catching up uh, to be done. I'm happy that the European manufacturers are on the path and they're very quickly catching up and overtaking in some parts, but we lost uh, uh, a precious time. And in climate emergency, in biodiversity emergency, we have no time to lose. Thank you. Um, I have a, qu a question from the sustainability coordinator at Technological University Dublin, Andy Maguire. He asks, um, interventions like rewilding are necessary, but so is economic activity. Is it possible to provide examples to show how the Green Deal may help the EU to close the innovation gap with other continents? Absolutely. Uh, I think that's very well set in the question and, and we're always aware of, 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 of this part, let's say, even in my portfolio, I also have fisheries, uh, which is an economic activity. Overall, I think what's important to be understood, and this is where the message that I try to, 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 to state very clearly in my introductory remarks, that if we're going to have degraded soils, we're not going to have any harvest. And farmers are going to be the first one to suffer. That will also put us at the danger uh, of, 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 of food shortage risk. What's most important, if we won't have healthy uh, oceans and, and ecosystems, sea basins, um, there will be no fish. And fisheries as such activity won't be possible. So it's very clear that, you know, all these economic activities, you know, they start first of all from healthy soil, from healthy ocean, when there is a, a fish to catch, and only this done in a sustainable manner allows for those activities to be long-term profitable. Again, taking an example from the fisheries, we see that where we fish sustainably, carefully taking into account scientific advice and, 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 and basing our fishing activities at the MSY level, we have a better profit profitability of fleets but most importantly, there is a bigger trust of, 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 of fishermen and women in their sector. There is a possibility to attract young people on the fleets because they know that they have a future. Where we have unstable sea basins overfished, there is a steep decline in interest in, in, in the activities. So there is not only that there is really nothing to fish, but there is decreased uh, interest decreased interest from investors as well to, 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 to invest into a sector, to, to, to upgrade uh, boats, uh, vessels, and, and, and so on. 
So, so, so there is one could not exist uh, without the other, and therefore I think it is it is it is uh, extremely extremely important to make sure that of course our uh, measures <clears throat> they take into account socio economic balance, and that's why from the very beginning we said that uh, green deal can only be possible if it has everyone on board, if no one is left behind. A forester in Scandinavian forest, a fisherman on the Mediterranean Sea, a coal miner in Poland, all of them, they have to be a part of the transition. Otherwise, a uh, Green Deal is not going to be success. Um, yeah, so I guess I will we'll stop here. Okay, well, thank you. There's a, I, a I, question. I, I see there is increased number of questions, so yeah. I started to limit my answers because. <laughs> well, um, the, the question of, um, uh, you, you indeed stressed the importance of environmental governance uh, in order to close the implementation gap. Uh, how important is the eighth environment action program uh, to, in strengthening the EU's uh, governance framework? So that's that's a good question um, because with the you, we we are quite in a unique moment of 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 of, of how to say political cycle well where the European Commission I would say first time ever takes uh, environmental policies climate policies as their top priority never before was it the case and therefore I think environmental action plans was extremely important to know at least the scope and where the union was moving and to ensure that there is a, uh, a agreement between the council and, and the parliament so everyone sort of played the role. Now, uh, with the European Green Deal, with its very ambitious, uh, ambitious policies, eight environmental uh, action program sort of loses a bit its face. And I will. I am very thankful to to to, to Parliament and, and and to Council who already recognized that that we're going to take a, a a a thin approach. But most importantly, I think what we need to achieve is is to make sure that it is sort of a European Green Deal legal uh, legal wheel on the ground, which ensures that what we have uh, already proposed and and put up front as. Uh, uh, Green Deal policies and, and, and strategies that it would be implemented. And that, uh, I think, uh, that's the role which APAP can uh, successfully play. We just started, we just started uh, our trilogues with, with, with the Council and, and the Parliament, uh, but I see a, a, a very positive, uh, uh, positive way forward. And I think we will uh, soon, in, in maybe a couple months of time after couple more trilogues, we're going to have a, a, a positive outcome, which will make a, a good legal framework where we'll have uh, institutional commitment uh, for the Green Deal, and it will be framed uh, into APAP. Great. Thank you. Um, uh, a colleague of uh, Laura's uh, um, at the EPA, um, as uh, Kian Omani, asks, are there proposals to review the need for an EU soils directive to help the careful and appropriate use of the soil resource and land management activities across uh, multiple sectors. So on, on, on soil, uh, you know, there is no such thing as soil directive to, 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 to begin with. And, and there is, there, that's, that's, that's something that, that really maybe a bit worries me. And, and, and because we, we sort of, address issues with soil in our zero pollution action plan for water, uh, for air, water and soil. Uh, we also going to have a new soil strategy, uh, then a mission under horizon, which is a mission in the area of soil health and, 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 and food. And, and then a also <clears throat> soils will be covered in a legal uh, proposal for EU nature restoration targets. But to be honest, that that's a little bit mixed picture for me, because on one hand, we do sort of cover soil in, in many areas that we work on. But on the other hand, we don't have a, a, a unified solid uh, legislation on soil, which 
I would like to have. Of course, uh, I need to carefully uh, pick my words now and say that uh, we are looking at the, at the feasibility of, of soil directive, uh, directive as, as such possibility. I think um, uh, we need, of course, member states on board uh, because my predecessor, uh, Janusz Potocznik, he tried and, and, and it didn't work. Uh, member states at that time was not ready uh, for a soil directive. Maybe with this unique uh, opportunity window, we might get a bit luckier, but it still needs uh, a lot of work to be done. Uh, I see some positive sign from, from some member states who are more ambitious, but we need uh, those who are less ambitious uh, as well on board. And, and, and therefore, I think that would serve as a great good, uh, uh, European Union, our farmers, our foresters, and, and, and overall speaking about ecosystems and, 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 and biodiversity uh, protection, if we would have a, a, a policy on soil. You know, it, uh, not unrelated, uh, there's a question about carbon capture and storage. Um, this being discussed as an important and emerging tool, of course, in the decarbonization process. Uh, you mentioned that carbon capture is an important element of the Green Deal's uh, work on biodiversity. Does the EU have a carbon dioxide climate sink target on the amount of carbon that will be sequestered by natural ecosystems? That's 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 a good 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 question to 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 glean a little bit. Uh, of course, we at, under Fit for Fifty Five, we're going to have a, a Lulu CF target increased, increased, but also 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 it has to be realistic for member states to 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 implement, and 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 not all member states uh, are, are are ready for it. But we will definitely need to put. Uh, to 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 put uh, a lot of a lot of a lot of um, uh, a lot of effort into that. What's most important, where I think uh, we we speaking now in a good circle to discuss such issues, but what I am missing now in the debate a lot when when even I participate in in, in events that everyone tends to focus on 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 fancy things uh, such as electric vehicles, uh, such as uh, technologies which will be able to, to absorb carbon or, 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 or whatever do with it, and really forgets to uh, uh, discuss how we can actually take a better care of our nature, who did it for millions, uh, hundreds and millions of years and did it quite well for us. And then due to our activities, it's actually uh, sometimes fails to do. So there, I think, uh, needs a, a much broader discussion on biodiversity protection, uh, on, 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 on not on only protecting uh, biodiversity, protecting marine areas, protecting forests and, 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 and lands, but also uh, on restoration, on ambition, on ambitious restoration targets. And it's a good moment to do so because we are on the way to Kuming. And even so, it was postponed due to COVID. We have huge issues in, in, in dealing sort of with, with an issues, with negotiations. I finally get to, to meet my, my colleague ministers from, from, from Asian, from African countries. Of course, we're in a good touch uh, with, with more ambitious uh, countries. I think we need to have an ambitious agreement on, on biodiversity protection in Kunming, but not only 30 for 30 target, which I think is, is, is already very well placed as, 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 as a marketing tool and everyone's sort of uh, happy to announce it that they will support 30 for 30 target, which is great. But I think we need to agree also on restoration targets. We need to agree on funding. We need to agree on concrete territories, which we're going to protect and, and what sort of protection we're going to ensure, what is going to be uh, our management plans and, and, and monitoring, how we're going to assess progress, when and, and where, and, 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 so, uh, and so many details is there. So in, instead of focusing on, on, on something which is fancy, and I'm sure innovators will come up with something, we need to ensure that we also do 
our best to ensure that those ecosystems which exist for, for millions of years and do an excellent job, that they actually continue to do so and do not stop uh, because the reasons for that is, is only uh, human activity. Um, there's a question, Commissioner, uh, which is, is quite specific in, in relation to the implementation side on, on the fishing industry. Uh, yeah. Deirdre Murphy asks, currently the fishing regulations such as uh, tracking technology on boats are optional. Um, mm -hmm. Are there plans to uh, uh, make regulations uh, to, to enforce these uh, regulations? But I think we only speak about uh small boats that that uh, for for which it's optional because for for larger boats it's 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 not and it's uh, also you know question question of uh, security but overall speaking now we have a very important control regulation uh, negotiations trialogue in in parliament uh, between uh, commission parliament and the council and positions there differ quite a lot uh, it took three and a half years for commission to put forward a proposal on, on, on control regulation. And my goal is not uh, in, 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 in at any price, not to lower a, a control regulation on, on fisheries, but to improve it, of course, modernize it, but to also ensure a compliance and ensure that we get accurate data from, from our fishing fleet. And not only, you know, large boats, but, but also small ones, uh, also, we need to get uh, accurate data from uh, from uh, recreational fishing, uh, even so that it might be sometimes harder. But we have to know exact numbers, how much we take from the oceans, so what that we could assess. And then even sometimes we have days where uh, fishermen and women they need our help in support. So I always say that it's like in a pharmacy or or, or a doctor's visit. So if you want a good uh, medicine uh, to be to be prescribed, you have to give me an accurate data. So I would know how can I help you. Otherwise, when I have inaccurate data, it's very hard to 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 help you. Uh, so I, I think therefore it's in their interest as well. And we have an excellent and 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 and, and well devoted uh, fishermen and women community who are honest, who comply with the rules. And I think it's also for their benefits that we ensure that, that there is a compliance and, and monitoring of, of, of fishing vessels, of their fishing patterns. Uh, because again, uh, there will be a lot of challenges ahead of us, not only uh, a decrease, uh, decline of, of, of some stocks, we have, we're going to face increased use of the sea, energy projects developed there, shipping routes, um, Marine protected areas, uh, and 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 so on. Tourism, and so there will be increased uh, uh, pressure on the sea. So I, I think you know monitoring, gathering that data from from the fishery sector will help us in 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 planning those activities, in ensuring that they have their patterns and and that we also uh, comply with 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 all the rules. Thank you. I have two questions from Una Duggan. The first one, um, I'll take them one by one, um, if I may. The first one is a, a transparency in the review of national uh, uh, CAP strategic plans. Uh, are, are we okay? We're yeah. okay for another 10 minutes, are we, uh, Commissioner? Yes, yes. That's, that's yes. okay, yeah. Um, the, uh, Una's question was transparency in the review of national cap strategic plans is critical. Yes. And uh, what steps will your directorate general undertake to provide transparency so that environmental NGOs can ensure that these plans are ambitious for climate, for nature and for water? So first of all, now it's uh, the member states are only in, 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 in the process of, of preparation, uh, uh, their national strategic plans. I'm always when I'm on, on, on the road to, 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 to member states and, and meeting ministers responsible for, for agriculture, uh, because usually it's the same person who is responsible for fisheries, so I have a privilege to meet them. Uh, I constantly remind them of, of, of what has to be included. And uh, 
do uh, no harm principle, which was uh, applied in, in our recovery and resilience plans, I think is, is a good principle to be upheld in, 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 in CAP uh, uh, national strategic plans. I think the process, uh, of course, has to be as transparent as possible uh, to, to, to ensure scrutiny. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, we will be closely coordinating with, with uh, our colleagues in DG Agri uh, to ensure uh, that, uh, that that's done and that we, uh, with the Commission's um, proposal, uh, we would achieve, achieve, achieve those goals. And, and, and of course, member states would ensure that they are on the path of, 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 of a green deal and, and green recovery. Um, thank you. This, the, second, the second question from, uh, from Una Duggan uh, gets into our uh, national legislative processes. Um, uh, she, uh, she says that we, uh, Ireland is planning to restrict access to judicial review, um, which uh, she feels could seriously hamper uh, NGOs' ability to challenge uh, planning decisions um, uh, ensuring that they're in line with uh, EU law. Uh, do you have any message for the Irish government? Um, it's very hard for me to 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 to, to comment on 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 on, uh, on a very concrete uh, uh, sort of you know matter, and and when I don't have a proposal, and I haven't seen it. But you know, what's very important is to to know that this is good for the Green Deal implementation. And we should uh, not uh, succumb uh, to the temptation to reverse uh, such, such a, a, a positive trend where actually NGOs can, can play their, 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 their important uh, uh, role. And uh, from very beginning you know, of, of my mandate, uh, we took uh, Aarhus Convention and, 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 and uh, you know, uh, shortage uh, of, of compliance very seriously. Uh, we addressed and adopted the decision in college very quickly, and, and I'm happy that, that now we have an agreement uh, which actually uh, ensures uh, um, implementation of, of Aarhus Convention in the EU. And, and of course, we expect a uh, similar uh, view from, 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 from the national governments around member states. Okay, um, uh, Alexander Conway from the IIEA asks, um, uh, do you have any concerns that um, some of the measures around the Green Deal may be politically uh, difficult, may be politically unpalatable um, in some member states? Um, he he uh, gives as an example the recent protests in Spain over the price of electricity. Um, you know, this thing of implementing uh, some of the Green Deal measures. So he's, he's absolutely right, uh, but not only about the Green Deal. I think overall, when we speak about change, you cannot expect, uh, you know, people uh, uh, to, to accept it uh, very easily. Uh, it will require it will require you know certain certain adjustments uh, realization that, that that some things are not going to be to be with us or they're going to change uh, and that therefore I said that we have to have a uh, just transition fund that this transition has to be fair to to, 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 to to everyone and it will require enormous effort it won't be easy you know when we speak and we when we have those plans in in front of us, it might seem a little bit too, too easy, uh, but I can tell you that it won't be easy. It will require tremendous efforts from, from member states, uh, especially when it uh, comes to, to green premiums, which sometimes are, are, are more expensive. Sometimes uh, market is not even ready for them. And, and, and this will require uh, certain solutions, uh, but that's the, the only choice uh, we have. Uh, I think, you know, what's very important for, for governments uh, to, to do an extensive stakeholder consultation. Each member state, they, they, they know the specifics of, of, of their country, of, of, of the member state, and, 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 and to, to ensure the smooth transition. 
I think now we have a biggest ever amount of, of, of public money to, to be spent. I'm talking about 1.8 trillion overall budget uh, here within the EU, which uh, will be spent by the member states. And we can only spend those money once. And if we fail to, to, to spend those money wisely, I would even probably it's wrong from, 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 for me to, to use word spend, I would say invest because it has to be investment into a future, into a green digital, which would help us to transit. And if those money invested well, they can bear fruits very quickly and help to soften that transition. If we will be spending, this is where I already use spend, uh, into a past, trying to, 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 to uh, buy a couple of votes for the upcoming elections, that's not going to, 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 to work out very well in, in the near future because you're just pushing away uh, socioeconomic problems which you inevitably going to face. And we have uh, regions which were hit very hard with uh, natural disasters, with forest fires, with, uh, with uh, also uh, loss of, 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 of uh, soil productivity, uh, soil erosion and degradation, which now is, 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 is a really problematic area which requires huge amounts of investments to, to be restored. Uh, and of course puts an additional political pressure and then you have to act under the crisis mode and, and, and so on. So, so I think uh, now we still have a little bit of time. We have a solid plan. We have funding in line. We need to, 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 to act. Um, we have a question from Porik Flattery. Um, uh, he, he, he argues that we have significant issues in Ireland with uh, what he describes as misinformation being spread by the agri-food lobby with regard to emissions and pollutions from agriculture. Um, what is the EU planning to do to support farmers to transition away from high methane dairy and beef farming? I think one, one of the, the important changes in, in the new cap is eco schemes, which uh, if member states, of course, depending on their uh, national strategic plans, if they use wisely, they will help farmers to uh, decrease uh, their emissions uh, 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 dramatically, uh, which will accompany them well in, in the transition. And not only uh, we, we're speaking here about the, the, the uh, uh, meat uh, farming, uh, we, we also have to, to, to take into account uh, dairy farming. We have to take into account uh, uh, huge uh, uh, uses of, 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 uh, um, of, 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 of course, uh, of um, uh, fertilizers. Yes, I lost the word. Uh, that's been quite a discussion. So uh, I think eco schemes now is, is, is a good tool uh, to help farmers in, in, in that transition. Each member state uh, will have to, to, to dedicate a sufficient amount of funding for eco schemes, but most importantly, they have to be uh, advertised uh, uh, and, and, and farmers have to be well uh, informed about uh, such possibilities. Uh, because I, I, I feel that, that in, 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 in especially when we speak about the agricultural sector, very much way forward uh, is usually business as usual. And, and, and we see that clearly it's, 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 it, it won't work out. Uh, it has an impact. Uh, it, it will have an impact on, on farmers' profitability. And inevitably, it will, it will lead to, to, uh, to the outcome, which is, which is, which is not... Uh, the one we expect and, and the one will, will, will profit farmers. So, so there is definitely has to be a, a strong decision to, to, to be made. And of course, uh, farmers has to receive help. And, and I hope that with the new cap, this gives a perfect possibility. Um, Commissioner, I, I, I think this next question from Pat Brereton from but Dublin City. Very, 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 very last because we uh, over a time and I have to run. 
Yeah, so, no, that's that's why I say it's the last the last question. Yeah, from Pat Brereton, but it's actually I think it connects with Alexander Conway's one, and what he asks is how can the benefits of the Green New Deal be best communicated um, uh, to to um, you know national uh, places like Ireland uh, as we struggle, you know. Can, can the EPA help us in trying to reduce pollution, increase diversity as we all face up to the interconnected challenges of climate change? So the emphasis on the positive the, the, uh, uh, in this the green green deal. Absolutely, uh, I, I think it's 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 a good question, and it re it requires a, a way bigger of discussion, maybe even a separate one, but but probably. A very important point, uh, of course, I'm very thankful to all the NGO scientists who work tirelessly and, 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 and work on, on raising that, 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 that awareness. But one very important thing that we are facing also a dramatic change in, in our economic activities, which cannot be any more measured, uh, measured only by GDP, which doesn't show really nothing. Because I feel that with only measuring GDP, we, we never take into account that, you know, uh, to build a, a factory, which will uh, we we need to 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 cut a forest. Uh, uh, we need uh, and the factory might be actually even 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 uh, uh, lowering the the standards of, of of air that we breathe or or water that we we drink. And so we don't take uh, such things into account, which extremely important and and therefore we are now already extensively discussing uh, with the parliament going beyond gdp uh, that will actually show uh, show uh, the real uh, the real picture of what are the costs uh, of, of of certain economic activities uh, which cannot be measured only in 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 in, in millions uh, of, of 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 profitability uh, which in the end of the day i think uh, is, is a very important uh, uh, measurement. And secondly, of course, it's important that people would feel the, the, the change and difference themselves, that uh, businesses would see that, 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 that going into a circular economy is actually a win-win solution, that they can save on resources, they, that they can reuse and, and their investments into, into, into technologies and, and, and digitalizing uh, uh, their, 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 uh, their technologies, it actually works out well that they saving money. For example, I always address over packaging. Do we really need so much packaging? Uh, can it be produced cheaper and so on? And we see a swift progress on that. So there is definitely a many win-win solutions, which I think when uh, our citizens, when people, businesses uh, uh, will uh, get a feel of them, it will be also a very good and positive communication that they will start speaking and, and sharing about those uh, positive examples, which is already plenty of them uh, around the EU. Commissioner, on behalf of the uh, EPA and the IIEA, can I thank you very much indeed apologize for trespassing on the on the on the time going a little over the time but there were a lot of questions a lot of interest in the vast area that you covered and also congratulate you on quite a detailed knowledge of the irish situation as well commissioner thank you very much indeed good thank afternoon you thank you to everyone who participated thank you for organizing and thank you for your questions <laughs>